the value of art is this equation that I, I developed for my book about forgery, where the value of art is the perceived rarity plus the perceived authenticity plus the perceived demand. And because you're perceptive, you'll have perceived that I said perceived three times in a row. Mm -hmm. It's all about what people think. The actual objective truth is irrelevant if the world thinks it's authentic. If you think there's huge demand for a work, then its value is equivalent. If you think a work is unique, even if there are 52 of them in, in the trunk of my car, the value is as if it's unique. Yeah, so Noah, where are you from? I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, very exotic, but I live in Slovenia, which is perhaps even more exotic. Okay, so how did you move to Slovenia? I married a Slovene, that's the short version, but I actually did a pretty thorough research and analysis of places I might like to live because I had the luxury of being portable as a writer. Okay. And I lived in eight different countries and I was auditioning them to be the future home base. And I knew I wanted to live in Europe. America's fine, but I always felt more at home in Europe when I was over here. So it was just a question of where I would find the future Mrs. Charney. And I ended up with a Slovenian. And now I live in the Alps. It looks like the sound of music. It's pretty great. Wow. You're interested in a lot of subjects, but one of the subjects is art crimes. Yes. So how did you get interested in that? So I came about it actually backwards. I was studying traditional art history, right. which interested me. I liked iconography of 16th century Florentine painting, which, you know, five people and my mother would have read about, but I was, was into well, it. Well, Jesse might know a little about it. Uh, I don't know about that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, first I thought I wanted to be a playwright. And when I was finished my undergraduate at Colby College in Maine, I wanted to go study in Europe and I applied for playwriting programs and art history programs. And somehow I got into both. And my art history teacher told me, Noah, you're an idiot if you don't go to the Corto Institute, which is probably the best place in the world for art history. It's in London. Right. No one will have heard of it if you're not an art historian, but for art historians, it's the place to be. Right. So I did that, but I was still interested in playwriting. I saw plays many times a week while I was in London, and I managed to get an agent for my playwriting. But she said, the plays are fine, but if you want to make money, you should write a novel. If you got a novel, I said, no, but I'll go and write one. And so I spent a summer writing what was my first book. I got very lucky. It was a big international bestseller and allowed me to become a writer full time. And it's the only novel I've published. It's called The Art Thief. Right. And while I was researching for it, I was doing the sort of proper academic research I was trained to do. And I realized that there was very little written about art crime from an academic perspective. I very quickly read pretty much every book that was published on it. So is that like... Is that like the burnt orange heresy, like that kind of book? Or like what kind of books were you reading? Well, the books I was reading at the time were mostly journalistic accounts of individual famous crimes. And they were borrowing facts from newspapers that were often mutually conflicting. And there right. was very little in terms of analysis. So I was pretty much the first to approach it from an academic perspective. And I developed an interest through research for writing this novel. And then I shifted my academic focus to the history of art theft. And I stumbled on something that was new. And I got very lucky because my novel came out at the same time that I was profiled in the New York Times Magazine, which did just wonders from a, from a PR standpoint. And all of a sudden, before I'd finished my postgraduate studies, I was the art crime expert. And I wound up teaching at Yale on art crime before I even finished my PhD. And it became the, the focus of my work. Right. I have a quick question, though. And you got to teach at home. That's so cool, right? You get to go back to New Haven and be the cool guy. But my question to you is, you know, you're going to go and you write this book, but and you're already in art, but why theft? Like, what what was it? Was because you was it just to have a good plot? I mean, because you're coming from narrative playwriting. What gets you into that part of, of art history or any or even any book? It's, it's a great question. And one of the, the other things I do is I do TV presenting. And whenever producers are pitching shows that I would present, it always comes across as nobody's interested in art, or at least they think the American public isn't. But everyone likes true crime. So I think crime stories are a good point of entry for any subject you might like to delve deeply into. So what I would do is, from an academic perspective, look at true crime stories stories that happen to involve art. When it came to writing a novel, I said, okay, I'd like to set a crime or multiple crimes behind the scenes in the art world. And I've had experience working at auction houses, at museums, and in academia. And the kismet of it was the Da Vinci Code had recently come out, which 
was a huge success. And I read in probably two sittings and I enjoyed it and was greatly annoyed by it because it's full of inaccuracies, errors. And if you know your history and your art, they're, they're annoying because they don't seem to advance the plot. They seem like just nobody bothered to check. Right. And I wanted to do something that would hopefully sell as many copies that didn't quite work out, but would have a similar appeal and pace, but would be scholarly in its research. And then at the same time, the Thomas Crown Affair remake with Pierce Brosnan came out. And I thought right. I'd like to do that in novel form. And so that all sort of came together in that first novel. Now, studying art history, what's your focus to think about how a work was made, how David was made or sculpted or, or things like that? Like, what are you... What are you thinking about when you're when you're doing that? Well, there's a little bit of the true crime element because what I most find interesting is iconography, which is the study of symbols in art. And it's mm -hmm. kind of ironic because in, in Dan Brown novels, the lead character, Robert Langdon, is called a symbologist, which is mm -hmm. a made up word. But what he should be right. called is iconographer. Right. And so it's the visual analysis of the content of works of art and seeing the work of art as a puzzle or a detective story and trying to piece together what the artist was hoping to convey. And a lot of the meanings were intentionally veiled or encrypted mm -hmm. because certain audiences were meant to understand them and others not. Other messages have been lost to us moderns because we have forgotten the visual vocabulary that would have been self-evident to educated viewers contemporary to the works. Or maybe that wasn't ever written down, right? It was never written down, so we don't know. So I would look at these, these famous puzzle paintings, like my favorite absolutely is Bronzino's Allegory of Love and Lust, which is mm -hmm. at the National Gallery in London. And when I lived in London, I would visit it several times a week. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a famous puzzle that we sort of think has been solved now, but that's what I enjoyed most. So it's basically borrowing the detective hat. And from an art history standpoint, I'm a detective analyzing the content of the work. And then I'm also analyzing what happens to those works when there's an actual crime committed and they go missing. The Museum of Lost Art, you know, what, what is that about? That's, a, I happen to have a copy here. Makes mm -hmm. an excellent Christmas present. Yes, this is um, one of my, my art books with a beautiful illustrated one. And that is an illustrated history of art that is no longer extant, that is lost. Right. And in art terms, extant means we know where a work is located. Lost is a Catch-all term for any work, the location of which is unknown. It could be that it was destroyed, probably or certainly. It could have been stolen. It could have been mislaid, buried. It could be literally just lost. But what I like about that term is it gives hope that the object can be found again. And so yeah. this book is divided into chapters based on how art can be lost and starts with a story of a work that was lost but almost miraculously rediscovered. And then I wanted to introduce the audience to works of art by famous creators whose work they know, but works they've probably never seen before, because we have what I call a, a survivor bias. We tend to focus on the few hundred works of art that are extant that we can visit in museums, mm -hmm. and that's fine, but they weren't necessarily the most important pieces when the artists were alive, the ones that they would have chosen for their legacy. And it surprises people to learn that for pre-modern artists, we know of many more works, in the case of most artists, than are extant, meaning that many more were lost that we know of through documentary history. For example, the Greek sculptor Lysippos, according to Pliny, he created around 1500 sculptures during mm -hmm. his career, and only one is extant today. So I wanted to shine light on this negative space of art history. That's true of the writers during that time too, sure. you know, hundreds of plays and then now only a few exist in fragments because it's hard to to get through history but now what does world war ii do to european art because a lot of things disappear then yeah absolutely world war ii was the greatest shift in cultural heritage objects in history according to some estimates some five million cultural heritage objects shifted hands inappropriately and it's a, it's an important era because all of europe was shaken by a nazi plan to proactively loot the best of europe's art they had an art theft division called the err it was founded by a guy named alfred rosenberg and wait wait, wait. alfred rosenberg a jew a Jew? Uh, he has a, a, a Germanic name. It's, he wasn't oh. Jewish, but uh, that's just a okay. German surname. But, but, okay, but, sorry. Yeah. 
Um, yes, you got her excited and, all of a sudden. Like, what? Yeah, I got excited, yeah. And they're, they're amazing stories because they've managed to loot some of the greatest masterpieces and the museums that are scattered throughout Europe. A lot of works were hidden. Some works were hidden and never recovered. And there's some amazing dynamic stories, for instance, involving the Monuments Men, who were allied officers who were tasked with protecting and recovering monuments and works of art. And there were these amazing stories of races to try to recover works, including one that I talk about often because it had written about it in several books and, and hosted a few TV shows about it. There's a secret salt mine at a place called Altasse in the Austrian Alps. It was converted into this James Bond villain style Nazi warehouse for stolen art. And more than 7,000 of the most important stolen artworks during the Second World War were stored there. And the destination was going to be a super museum that Hitler envisioned for knocking down the entirety of the city of Linz, Austria, and creating a citywide museum. And some of the works, like the Ghent altarpiece, were considered the, among the most important ever created. And I have a whole book about the story of the Ghent altarpiece, and it was stored there and quite miraculously recovered by monuments men and some, some Austrian double agents and miners. So it's full of these dynamic cinematic stories Treasure hunts where art is the treasure. You know, I just want to know when the Nazis were kind of collecting this art, did it matter what the ethnicity of the artist was? You know, did they only take art from, you know, white I people? I think they, I think they, uh, I think they didn't really, but when their art collecting came to pass, it was really just the best well, artists. That's you know, what I don't I'm think saying. It was, yeah, that's what they I'm did. saying. I, I some of those, they, yeah. some of their, uh, you know, they didn't think Jews were too, too bad in terms of their art collections. You know what I mean? I don't know. Well, anyway, okay. It's a good question, Priscilla, and the answer is that part of their proactive culling of artworks even before the war began, the first people looted were German citizens, and the Nazi officials would take objects that they wanted, but they also took art that they termed degenerate, and they held a series of degenerate art exhibitions, which were intentionally curated in the least flattering way possible, and actually written on the wall when you walked in was terminology saying, this is what we are saving your children from, this sort of deranged art. And what they didn't like was modern art, abstract, minimalist, post-impressionist, and works of art by minorities, but also some German artists like Otto Dix, who was as Germanic as they get, they didn't like his approach, what he was presenting, or the fact that the art was visually unflattering. So these works were captured and caged and displayed. And there was supposed to be a wing of the Linz Super Museum that was sort of meant to be a hall of horrors from the Nazi perspective to show what not to do. But they would, uh -huh. they would get anything that they thought was of value, but they particularly favored artists and subject matter that they associated with Aryanism. So Scandinavian and Germanic artists and their favorite artist of all was Jan van Eyck. And the number one work that both Hermann Göring, who was looting for his personal collection, and Hitler wanted for his Linz Super Museum, was the Ghent Altarpiece, which is the subject of, of one of my books. So this was the number one work that they were after seeing Jan van Eyck as an Aryan Germanic individual, and the physiognomy of the figures in the painting were the, this Aryan ideal. I think some of the wow. Otto Dix works are in New York now, yeah? Yeah, the, um, the, little there museum are quite up a lot of them. Yeah, small little museum. Um, I have a chapter on Otto Dix in my newest book, which I happen to have a copy of here called The Devil yeah. in the Gallery, yeah. how scandal, shock, and rivalry shaped the art world. And there's a chapter on Otto Dix and some of the paintings that were considered most shocking to the authorities during the Third Reich and were the reason that he was marginalized. Now, do you remember where you were when you heard about the guy who'd been hoarding all the paintings and they, they just discovered him a few years ago. I think he passed away already, you know. Uh -huh. The Gerlich collection maybe you're thinking of. Yeah. yeah. For me, that's fascinating because there are certainly millions of works of art that are still lost that we know of. Many of them may be irrevocably destroyed, but one always hopes that there are these hordes and you hear legends about them and you think, well, that can't possibly be the case. And then every once in a while, something comes up like this. There were over 1,500 lost artworks in a single apartment. And one wonders how many more of those hordes are out there that we simply haven't come across. You know, and the guy tried to sell one and then they went back to his apartment and he, I think he passed away from the, the 
Yeah, it was, it was many all. years ago. Cornelius Gurlitt was his name. And I keep an eye on this also because when I was still a student, I founded a nonprofit research group called ARCA, the Association for Research into Crimes Against Art. And it was the first think tank research group on art crime. We founded the first academic program in the field, which you could study art for the first time, the first academic journal. And so this has been a good way to keep tabs on all of the latest information and, and try to teach the next generation of people a subject that you really couldn't study before we began to teach it. A lot of those treasures are in Russia, no? They're still there and they won't give them back. Yeah, a, a lot of them, it, it, it happened like the, the Nazis looted from Europe and then the Red Army looted whatever they could from the Nazis, rationalizing that it was some sort of reparation. There were also some allied soldiers who were looting, but it was on a much lower scale, whereas the Red Army was doing so systematically. And indeed, there are works that were subsumed into the Soviet Union. We don't know where they are now, or some have been located, but they haven't been returned. Can you just draw the link for the audience, please? You know, starting a nonprofit, that's a whole other story. I think it's amazing that you did that at a young age, but what is lost when we lose this art? Like what, you know, the bigger context, because you're saying it's sort of, it seemed obscure at the time, but we're really talking about our entire historical perspective of the world before. I mean, give us the greater sort of repercussions of, of stolen art and what that means. Well, when, when art is lost, we have a limited view of the breadth and depth of, of creative geniuses. Of, so it's important also from the perspective of making sure that works that do come to light are authentic. And another one of my books is about forgery. So it's a linked concept. So imagine if we knew that Beethoven had written 25 symphonies, but only nine of them are extant. It would be a big question mark. It might be quite frustrating. It might be inspiring. And then let's say the 10th symphony was found and it expands and alters the way we need to think about that creator's oeuvre. But what if an 11th one is found and it's really lousy and it turns out, well, maybe he wrote a bad symphony or maybe it's a forgery. So these issues come up, especially when there are fraudulent objects that are affixed to the, the career of one of these greats. But each time an authentic one resurfaces, it's very exciting because we have to reshape our concept of what they contributed, their biography, a new analysis. And it can also happen when you see beneath the surface of an existing work. For example, Kazimir Malievich has that famous painting, Black Square, and an analysis in a special stream of light that allows you to see beneath the surface of the painting found that there were actually two paintings underneath it, and they were formal. They weren't abstract the way we normally associate with them. And that changes the way we have to think of the artist. So occasionally you can have lost works that are actually lurking beneath the surface of an object that we think that we have and know well. So will you talk about um, odalisk and red trousers? Because that's a slightly different problem. Yes, of, yes, of course. Well, that, that is a painting that was the star attraction of a gallery in Venezuela. And it turned out that at some point it had been swapped for a forgery. The original disappeared. And it took a couple of years for anyone to notice. So this is indeed the case. You know, it's very embarrassing for the institution. It's embarrassing to scholars. But at the same time, it's a little bit funny. And one of the things that I try to keep in mind is to not take myself or my field too seriously, to have a good sense of humor about it, because there are a lot of, of funny stories. And people also, the general public, tends to feel a disconnect with the art world. And this is especially clear in European tabloid media, the idea that because Europe still has this latent class system that we don't have to the same extent in the US, there's an idea that art is for an elite group of wealthy collectors and not for the general public. And so when these collectors have the wool pulled over their eyes, there's a certain schadenfreude and the idea that maybe they, they were asking for it. And it's fun to see the emperor has no clothes. That is especially the case when we see how art crimes reported in the press. It's often romanticized and forgers in particular are considered these sort of crafty Loki-like magicians who are not the least bit scary and are really quite fun. And that is sometimes the case, but, but not quite as romantic as the media tends to portray. Now, what's your feeling on things like the Elgin marbles, like whether they should be returned to Greece or, or it's okay that they're sitting in a museum in England? 
It's a very good question I've been thinking about recently because my next project this winter is I'm going to be presenting a BBC program about the systematic theft of Chinese antiquities from European collections and asking who's behind it and whether there are Chinese authorities who might be behind this, this rash of thefts. And Chinese would argue that these objects were looted from us, therefore it's our moral right to re-loot them and take them back. In the Elgin Marbles, there's no legal question under the, the regime that Elgin bought the marbles from. He thought he was preserving them from the Turks who were occupying Athens at the time. They were actually using the Parthenon and the Acropolis as targets for cannon fire so that there was a concern that these statues would have been destroyed irrevocably. And he legally purchased them, but from a hostile occupying force. So there's not a legal question. The moral question is different. And it's hard for me to say, really, I feel like ideally cultural heritage should be returned to the place where it was always meant to be, that art should be seen in situ. But it's complicated by the fact that a lot of these countries didn't exist in their modern formation. For example, Italy is a product of uh, the 1860s. So if you said that a Titian painting should go back to Italy, Titian would be rolling over in his grave because Titian certainly didn't think he was Italian. He was Venetian and he would have thought association with all those Italians was outrageous. Yeah. But if Titian was working for, you know, Swiss Austrian Habsburgs in Madrid and was mm -hmm. from Venice, then should Italy be able to repatriate his paintings? It's a complicated question. I like yeah. the idea that these are world museums and everybody should be paving the way for everyone to see each other's cultural heritage. But if something is really dedicated to a location, I personally much prefer art pilgrimages to a specific location to see a single work in situ than to go to a universal museum. When you see things like, um, you know, the statues, the Buddhas being knocked down in, in Iraq, this is a world cultural loss on a staggering level. You know, what's your feeling about that? Can we recreate them? We have the measurements. We, we you know, we know everything about you know, we, we, we probably could do a facsimile in the same place, but what does that mean, you know? It's a very good question. It's one component of my study of the history of art, crime, iconoclasm, and vandalism. The distinction being vandalism, there's no symbolic value to the object targeted. In iconoclasm, you attack something because of what it represents. So, for example, the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan that the Taliban blew up, you know, you'd always rather have something stolen than destroyed, because if it's destroyed, it's gone forever. If it's stolen, there's a very good likelihood that it will resurface. So it's a, it's a complete tragedy. I like the fact that um, not long ago, uh, Egyptian authorities declared the destruction of cultural heritage to be a capital crime, one of the highest thing, uh, types of crime that one can commit. Mm -hmm. And it's heartbreaking. Reconstructing, I think, is not a bad option if there are no other options. It's never going to be the same, but we have incredible technology to 3D scan and from those scans to essentially 3D print or to recreate in the original medium. But it's not going to have this sum. Um, it's going to look superficially like the original. But Walter Benjamin has this famous essay, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, where he basically says, I don't know what's so great about great art, but it has an aura. And it's, there's a mystical element to it. And if we could explain it all scientifically, it would somehow remove some of the greatness. So let's just say that there's an aura around great authentic art and the reproductions, while intellectually useful, don't have the same vibe to them. How would you describe Stendhal syndrome? Thinking, speaking of an aura around great art. I mean, I'm curious, yeah, you know. Uh, I, I can sympathize with it. It's no longer so much of an issue in the age of the internet and of cheap airlines, but Stendhal syndrome is, is a clinical syndrome. People are treated in the hundreds every year for it. And Stendhal suffered it because he knew that he was going to Florence and Rome, and he would probably be there once in his life for a finite amount of time. And he was basically freaking out because he wanted to see everything and he thought he wouldn't have time to do it. And he had a nervous breakdown and it happened in both locations. And I, I kind of like that. I can sympathize. I feel like it's, it's less of an issue now because we can, we can travel virtually so much more easily. And we can also travel physically when there's no pandemic on so much more easily with these inexpensive airlines. So it may no longer be such an issue, but I love the, the poetry of it. So I always thought it was it was it being in awe of something. You know, when, when I went to Italy, I sort of probably invented it myself when I saw 
you know, an actual Da Vinci or I, I saw, a, you know, a Michelangelo, that sort of unbelievable thing. And you don't know whether it's, you think that, you think you're being told that it's going to be the greatest work of art, where it really yeah. is the greatest work of art. That's an interesting observation. I've often wondered that myself. And I, I used to live in Rome and I taught there and I would lead students around and we would go to locations and they would sort of be psychologically primed to be in awe. And I always wonder if they just stumbled on something, whether it would have the same reaction. It's not very scientific. It's a kind of a little bit new agey, but I feel like if so many hundreds of thousands of people over centuries have traveled to and been awed by a religious relic, a building or a work of art, that there, on the one hand, there must be something to it. On the other hand, I wonder if there's some sort of vibe, for lack of a better term, that permeates the location because you have places that are otherwise not the least bit dramatic and prepossessing like Lourdes, where there people respond with these miraculous cures when they pray to the Virgin Mary. And you wonder if there's nothing aesthetic about the place that is particularly striking, but the, the vibe and I think the psychological priming is really powerful. So one of the things that I think is important to do is to remove the intimidation from art because I think too many people feel like oh, I'm not going to get it it's not for me and that's a great shame and unfortunately the art world tends to like to perpetuate that feeling that it's a private club and not everyone is invited so one of the things I try to do with my writing is intentionally speak in a vernacular and avoid using words like vernacular and try to talk in the most casual possible way but with scholarly information. And the book I just finished that comes out next year is called The 12 Hour Art Expert, Everything You Need to Know About Art in a Dozen Masterpieces. And the goal is to smash through all of the pretense about art and just say, what if you just stumbled on this? What if I didn't tell you anything about this? What would it feel like? Would it have the same reaction? And I'm not sure how many of the great works would still have that if they weren't hyped as much as they are. Salvatore Mundi. So is it, does it matter? Is it a masterpiece or is it just a, another painting? So, okay. I, I know that there's a lot of people who thought maybe it's a copy or a derivative work or a forgery. Um, it was certainly thought to be a derivative work in 1940 something. It sold for 45 pounds as a 19th century pastiche trying to look Leonardo-ish. The reason that I feel confident that it's authentic is I'm friendly with Martin Kemp who's the world's leading Leonardo scholar. He very kindly wrote the foreword to this book and he feels that it's authentic, so I trust him. I also interviewed the conservators who spent years restoring it and they seen it every which way and they're certain that it's authentic. So based not on my own personal opinion, but on the opinion of these people who have been hands-on with it, I am confident that it's authentic. So if it wasn't authentic, it would still be worth 40 pounds? And being that we now think it's, you first you said feels authentic, then you said certainly authentic, now it's worth 450 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty good inflation rate from 45 pounds to 450 million. The, the prices are, are quite arbitrary, to be honest. The value is as much as, the, as someone's willing to pay, and there has to be some competition or perception of competition. The value of art is this equation that I, I developed for my book about forgery where the value of art is the perceived rarity plus the perceived authenticity plus the perceived demand. And because you're perceptive, you'll have perceived that I said perceived three times in a row. Mm -hmm. It's all about what people think. The so, actual objective truth is irrelevant if the world thinks it's authentic. If you think there's huge demand for a work, then its value is equivalent. If you think a work is unique, even if there are 52 of them in, in the trunk of my car, the value is as if it's unique. So if I took a photograph of it and I put it on the blockchain. Oh, I was going there. The NFT. I was going there with people. You know, and I called it an NFT yeah. and I sold it and there was only one and it was scarce. What do you think the value of, of the Mundi painting would be? Well, it, it's a great question. I'm actually planning to do a book on NFTs. It, we're hitting all the right spots. You know what the, the, it comes down to? It comes down to creating demand. I'll put it this way. And NFTs are conceptually really weird, but I understand them because I understand the history of art and collecting. And the same equation is true. Perceived rarity, if there's only one, there's only one. Perceived authenticity, the blockchain is 
one of the benefits is it allows you to, to be certain of authenticity, or at least to trace every step in the lifespan of a creation. And then perceived demand, that's what it's all about. If you can get an NFT platform or influencer to promote it, then its value will be huge. If it is the greatest NFT in history and it is not picked up by a platform, then nobody will notice. That's the unfortunate truth. It's all about PR. But here's the thing, you know, kind of, you know, you, you just, you wrote a book around, let's make it not elite, art not being elite. And so the struggle between something, you know, that even on the blockchain, you, you people sells it for whatever it was, 65 million, I think was that sale. How do we battle that? you know, perception, how do we make, I mean, I think Jesse's working on this. How do we make the NFT not an elite face? And yet well, it's still you, could, you could still have the JPEG of the picture. You can have that for free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, it, it, it's, um, I think most NFTs, I mean, there's just an ocean of them coming out and mm -hmm. most of them, nobody pays any attention to and they don't sell. And you really need to, to have some sort of higher exposure, usually one of these select platforms forms picking them up and by virtue of that fact it makes it elite and the prices right. have been totally outrageous for works of art frankly you know the early phases of nfts from an art perspective they're totally dreadful there's nothing interesting about them at all and the people every day at least they're they're good works and there's five thousand of them in one and that's that has has its own interest but he needed you know christie's to, to yeah. auction it in order to give it that sense that it is part of the elite dialogue and the pool of collectibles. And so generally it's absolutely for the masses. You can see that, for example, with the NBA Top Shot virtual collectible cards. There's nothing the least bit pretentious about them, but people are willing to pay what they're willing to pay. And a, a lot of these are very inexpensive. The issue that I think is going to be interesting is how many of them are going to retain value or raise in value the way really good authentic art from identified artists is. And I think we need to see that in the future. I think the answer is very few of them. But I do think that as a form, they will be present because they, especially with smart contracts and the fact that you can build in a guarantee, for example, that the artist will get 10% of future sales. That's something the artists have never really been able to do before. Yeah. Also, you're starting to see for the first time royalties built into acquiring an NFT. So you would buy, used to buy an MP3 from the weekend and all the royalties stay with him. You have a unique access to a file. You don't even have the file. You just have a link to a file and you get the bragging rights that it's yours, but that's it. And the next step will be, okay, if you pay an exorbitant sum for this song, then you get a percentage of the royalties when the song plays. And I think that will become more prevalent. And then we'll start to see smart contracts when it comes to creative output, replacing traditional contracts. So you've written a lot of books. 15-ish. 15 you give um, words to your feelings, right? You know, your feelings about a painting, but when you first see a Raphael painting or you first see a whoever, you know, what's the thing that grabs you the hardest? So before you give words to it, what, what is the emotional thing, a resonance of an art piece for you? When I walk into a room in a museum, I do a quick scan. And my eye is usually drawn to just a couple of objects in each room. It's often from certain periods that I like more than others. And I think that's a purely personal standpoint. My favorite period is mannerism, which is not everyone's cup of tea. But when I walk into a room, I can spot the mannerist work from across the room. And that's the one I'll gravitate towards. There's a vibrancy and immediacy, uh, a liveliness to the works that I'm drawn to. And they require you to, to look deeper. I think that's also, so for example, the most popular movement in, among the general public is Impressionism. But it's a little bit of a joke among art scholars that if you're an Impressionist scholar, there isn't all that much to study. You can study the artists' biographies and their relationships, but Impressionist paintings are studies of how light falls on inanimate objects. And so there, there's not a lot of there there, but it's beautiful. So what I like are these puzzle works that I look at and I wind up doing this iconographic analysis. And part of it is that you need to learn or relearn this visual vocabulary of icons where images stand for ideas 
that we have lost, but would have been self-evident basically prior to the 1930s when we began to stop teaching these things. And then knowing that vocabulary, it's like if you decide you're going to learn Slovenian, you need a few hundred vocabulary words, mm -hmm. and then you can get the gist of it. Once you have them, you have to piece together what people are saying. Well, for me, I have the visual vocabulary, and I like works of art that draw me in and insist that I study them because I feel like they are a visual riddle that wants solving. Is that like the unicorn tapestries, like that piece? Sure, that would be one good example. There are a handful of these famous mystery works, but you know, most of the works have a component at least that wants solving. And particularly when we look at pre-modern works, modern works have a different set of icons, but they're not the traditional ones. There's less puzzle there. It's more social political commentary. So what I'm most interested in are Renaissance, Mannerist and Baroque, paintings and sometimes sculptures, particularly Bernini sculptures, but mostly the paintings. And those have a built-in playful dialogue with certain viewers. And there would be insider references that a select audience would get right away. And others would have to have explained to them or they would look at it and see the beautiful aesthetic and they wouldn't be able to penetrate the surface. And that's, that's what I think is intriguing. I like this idea that I can break through this essentially code, Da Vinci code made that sound cheap, but that's really what it is, um, that was set up for a select few to unpuzzle. I think cryptographers probably have a similar reaction when they encounter a mathematical puzzle. And, and that, that's what I get really excited about. And I've stared at some of these works, you know, countless hours. And to me, that's, that's fascinating as a, as a philosophical problem. And, you know, how some people would work on a Rubik's cube. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about art as social justice in places where you cannot, let's say, have freedom of speech, but the artist will then embed the code, if you will, or a message to someone that might be viewing it or hearing it to have them do something, right? So what you're really talking about is context. And I think, you know, I know the difference between looking, going to a gallery or museum, and I find it really helpful to get the guide because I want to understand like, I think it's just so interesting to get that context on how do we, and it goes back to the elitism, do we have to be in a place where you have that access or can a viewer just go and look at something if they're open to it and just start to have an experience or do you need that context? It's a very good question. I, it depends on the, the, the period of art that we're dealing with. So that's the reason that Impressionist paintings is so popular. You don't need the audio guide. They're beautiful and that's about it. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem that I find and what I see when I have, have students that I'm taking to, to museums is if you don't know the context and the story behind it, then you're simply confronted with, do you think this is beautiful or not? And there isn't that much more you can do. But if you know some of the context, all of a sudden each work is its own world. And what I teach early on that I think is very important is to understand how Renaissance thinkers looked at art and to understand it and to elevate the status of fine arts, they looked to Aristotle's book on poetics. And in that, Aristotle writes about, he's writing about drama and poetry, but they appropriated that to be a shorthand description of what makes for great works of art. And I always ask my students to ask themselves these same three questions whenever they see a new work of art. The first is, is it good? And by this, he means, does it successfully accomplish what the artist set out to do? And so Keith Haring was trying to do stick figures. So a stick figure is good. If he was trying to do a photorealistic work, then it wouldn't have been good. Two is, is it beautiful? And that's purely subjective, but it doesn't have to be aesthetic beauty. It could be moral beauty. Like there's some beautiful crucifixion paintings, which are not aesthetically pleasing necessarily, but are supposed to be morally uplifting. And the third is, is it interesting? And that is the most complicated one because you need to know the context of when it was made and why and how it compares to other works of a similar subject matter. For example, you could have a, a whole course on Annunciation paintings. And why would that be interesting? Well, to compare them, they're all a little bit different. The interesting one is interesting also because in 1917, there was a famous sculpture called Fountain that was almost certainly made by Marcel Duchamp inspired by his friend, a baroness, but he never admitted to it. But it was uh, a urinal that he bought from a, a urinal factory turned on its side, signed with 
the name of the artist that was actually the name of the company he bought it from, R. Mutt. And he wrote the date 1917. And he tried to get a contemporary art museum to acquire it. And at first he was laughed out of the room, but eventually he succeeded and it was exhibited. And at that moment, art split. He was the first one to, to say, you know what? Classical art is this tripartite Aristotelian definition. It has to be good, exhibiting skill. It has to be beautiful and it has to be interesting. From now on, I'm declaring that art does not have to exhibit skill. It does not have to be traditionally beautiful. It only has to be interesting. And then we have these two parallel roots. On the one hand, there's the traditional style, which people still do, people like John Curran. And then, and then the other, we have conceptual art, which only has to be interesting. And I, I'm a traditionalist, but I understand the, the appeal of the conceptual. Just yeah, so saying the, the uh, Empire State Building, although I don't think it's still on there. I'm not, I'm not surprised. Yeah, he was quite a character. But, but how do you understand the context of uh, Angel Bridge? If you're looking at Bernini, like how do you, because like I've been across the bridge, it's incredibly beautiful, but I don't really understand any, I don't understand the meaning behind, you know, the sculptures, you know what I mean? Well, those, those, I think he did only one of them. They were from his studio and his followers. So that, that one is maybe less of an iconic work for me, but you know, it, it involves statues of angels, each one of which is holding an implement that was involved in Christ's passion. Mm. And so the idea is it's a perception bridge that you would walk across as part of a procession during the Easter celebrations. And part of the idea of looking around you while you're in a church and being surrounded by statuary stained glass or paintings that represent what the priest is talking about is a tradition that deals with an entirely or almost entirely illiterate public. And you have to keep in mind that prior to the Reformation, most people attending a church service wouldn't understand a word of what's going on. It was all in Latin and mm -hmm. only the sermon would have been in the vernacular. And so they have to rely on the priest to explain all of this nonsensical Latin that they might have memorized because they've heard these prayers so often, but they have no idea what it means. And so you get bored. And I think people understood that. So you space out and you look around and the idea is that everything you see is bringing you back to what you're supposed to be thinking about and explaining it in a visual way that will resonate to an illiterate public. Because only a tiny percentage of those in attendance would have actually been able to read and would have known and studied the stories and have read the Bible themselves and understood it. I will never be in a church the same way again with, with the way that you just said that. <laughs> Noah, we could keep going. We might have to have you come back um, yeah, sure. It can't be lost on us that you are wearing, uh, you know, a Da Vinci, probably from your friend Martin Kemp or whatever, right? Isn't that uh, Mona Lisa? Yeah, this somewhere? is actually, this is a Banksy spray paint stencil of Mona Lisa with the bazooka. Uh, why okay. not, right? <laughs> why not? And there's so much. And Noah has like 15 books and is really, you know, there's so much to explore. Name it, we got it. <laughs> Devil in the gallery, that looks amazing. And yeah. we are going to talk to you offline about a couple of things, but yeah. um, it's it's fantastic. Must be late in Slovenia. You, you have a little bit of an accent, not a New Haven one. I just want to say you've picked up the <laughs> culturally something there. And what a pleasure. And thank you yeah, for coming. Thank you very much. Really thank appreciate you. it. My pleasure, guys. I'd love to come back anytime.